looking across the fence, the Battle of Plattsburgh. We'll learn what the impact of six days in September of 1814 had on our region, our nation, and the world. Good afternoon and thanks for joining us. I'm Judy Simpson. The War of 1812 between the United States and Great Britain is sometimes called the Second War for Independence. War between Great Britain and France had been raging across Europe for nearly a decade before British forces from Canada began attacking American forts along the Great Lakes. Before too long, the U.S. Navy was facing off against the greatest power to ever set sail, the British Royal Navy. Our story begins in the summer of 1814. 10,000 British soldiers have massed at the border between New York and Canada, while in a nearby Royal Navy shipyard, the largest warship to sail on Lake Champlain nears completion. Let's join Vermont historian Howard Coffin and across the fences Keith Silva as they bring us the Battle of Plattsburgh. The British are coming. 37 years after the American Revolution, Britain again invaded the United States of America. In 1775 at Boston, the signal was by land or by sea. At Plattsburgh, New York, the British came in 1814 by land and by sea. This monument is a monument to a great man, Thomas McDonough, and to a great battle that happened on Lake Champlain and happened on the land around Plattsburgh. Captain Thomas McDonough, a Marylander, had been assigned by the War Department to head the naval defense of Lake Champlain. In the winter of 1813 and 14, he built the main part of his fleet at Virgins. He knew the British were also building a formidable fleet north of the border on the Richelieu. McDonough for a time had his headquarters at Burlington. But in the summer of 1814, when it became known that the British would move down the west side of the lake, McDonough brought his fleet to Plattsburgh and the American army came across the lake and dug in on the south bank of the Saranac River. In the midsummer of 1814, the Americans were getting well prepared at Plattsburgh with about 5,500 troops. And then the War Department made a terrible mistake and transferred all but 1,500 of them to the west where they feared another British advance. So left at Plattsburgh, 1,500 men in panic those here at Plattsburgh appealed to Vermont for help. And everywhere in Vermont, though the state government wasn't too interested in having a war, militia units formed on village greens and headed for Plattsburgh. One unit that formed up was at Randolph Center under the command of Jacob Collamer, later to be a prominent U.S. Senator during the Civil War. So they came to Burlington so they came to Grand Isle. How to get here? It was like Dunkirk in reverse when the British evacuated a whole army in World War II. This time, boats of all kinds and sizes brought the Vermont militia across the lake and they landed here on these rocks south of Plattsburgh and marched up to the town to fight the British. British army of nearly 10,000 men crossed the international border and marched south toward Plattsburgh. It took them six days to reach Culver Hill. Waiting here were 350 American regulars, but mostly militia. The British came down two parallel roads. Here, the Beekmantown Road and then the shore road off to the east. More than 4,000 British soldiers marched down this road until they saw the Americans in position, and then they went from march formation 
to attack formation. They were perhaps the best soldiers in the world, dressed in red uniforms, everything done to perfection. The Americans must have been frightened watching this display of military might. And then the British ordered their battle line forward and the 350 Americans fought briefly and bravely, but then they turned, leaving casualties behind and headed back to get behind the Saranac River. The Americans keyed their defenses along the Saranac to three large forts. The only one that survives is Fort Brown, the southernmost fort. On the night of September 8th, Commodore McDonough came in from the fleet here to Fort Brown to check out a rumor he had heard. He went up on the ramparts of the fort and with his binoculars, he scanned the far side of the river. And to the south, he saw what he feared most, a battery of British rockets. McDonough was afraid that those rockets, which were very portable, would be brought around Cumberland Bay within range of his fleet to set his fleet on fire. That night, at his request, some army men under a Lieutenant McGlasson quietly raided the Saranac, attacked the rocket battery, and destroyed it. It was one of the important events that happened during this battle of Plattsburgh and might have saved McDonough's fleet. The British fleet waited for several days at Isle Lamont for the south wind to break. The night of September 9th, the sun set red and in the morning the wind had shifted to the north and the British came south. As we cross the lake on the ferry from Grand Isle, we go right through the route of the British coming for battle. As they came along Cumberland Head, which separates the main lake from Cumberland Bay, the American sailors on the far side could see the tops of the masts of the biggest British ship, the Confiance mounting 36 cannons, the biggest warship ever to ply Lake Champlain. Those sailors awaiting their first battle must have been frightened. How big was the Confiance, the biggest of the British ships? Well, this is just one of its anchors displayed here in the lobby of the Plattsburgh City Hall. Wow. On the morning of September 10th, the British faked a big attack at Plattsburgh and then swung about four miles to the west, finding a natural crossing at Friedenburg Falls almost like a highway of smooth stone. They came through the Saranac. Waiting for them were New Yorkers and Vermonters. And there were more Vermonters here in battle than New Yorkers, 2,500 Vermonters, as opposed to only 1,500 New Yorkers. The Vermonters fought like Native Americans, and they were fighting well. The battle seemed to draw, although the British numbers probably would have told, and suddenly the fighting halted. A silence prevailed on the battlefield. What had happened? British commander George Prevost, having found out that the British feet had been defeated on the lake, knew there was no sense in trying to push his army south, halted the fighting, did an about face, and headed for Canada. Much of the area where the Vermonters fought today is within the fences of the Plattsburgh Airport. At the time of the 1814 battle, 
This was known as Pike's Cantonment. For two years before the fight, Zebulon Pike, the famous Western explorer for whom Pike's Peak is named, had commanded troops in this area. We're some four miles from Pike's Cantonment on Cumberland Head along Plattsburgh Bay. One of the great American naval battles in all history took place right behind us. The American force consisted of 14 ships with 882 men and 86 guns. The British had 16 vessels, 937 men, 97 guns. The firing opened when the British sent one of their big ships, the Chubb, up along this coast trying to flank the American line. But suddenly, the Chubb's captain was warned that they were coming into shallow water. He had no choice but to spin his wheel sharp left, and it brought his ship to a standstill. Suddenly, he was fair play for American gunners who blasted the ship into submission. Now McDonough takes over a gun on his flagship and aims at the big confiant. And a matter of luck here because his first shot hits the steering mechanism of the confiance and it already is crippled. One of the first shots to hit the American flagship smashes a crate on the deck containing a pet rooster who flies up into the rigging and starts to crow and will throughout the battle. McDonough said it brought calm and spirit to his men instantly. Another break for the Americans. Within the first half hour of the fighting, Downey is killed. The British commander is out of the fight. Also, the British were up against McDonough's ingenuity. He had rigged up a system of anchors on his ships that allowed them to turn quickly, bringing broadside after broadside into play. Now it became a battle of broadsides. The decks ran red with blood. Three times McDonough is hit. Once a man beside him is beheaded and knocks him unconscious. But McDonough rises again to the fight. Finally, the Confiance is badly damaged beyond repair. And she runs up a flag of surrender. From Mount Philo in Vermont all the way up to Highgate in Swanton, Vermonters are on hilltops watching the smoke rise, hearing the thunder. And then they begin to hear things quiet. The wreckage on the decks was horrendous. Dead bodies floated in the water. A complete American victory. And McDonough would take the battered British fleet and sail it down to Burlington, to Burlington Harbor to show it off. But the War of 1812 was over. It was an American victory, and at the end of the year, the Treaty of Ghent would be signed in Europe that would end the whole thing. This fierce, bloody, thunderous battle of ships here at Plattsburgh was the last naval engagement ever fought on Lake Champlain. Never again would the British come south down the Champlain Corridor. The American northern border was secure. Additional funding for Mr. Coffin's work for this program was provided by National Life Group.